Anybody awake this morning? I tell you, will you give it up for the worship team one more time? Will you do that? Man, I'm just sitting here watching them, and I, I love Kristen's one of my favorite singers, and she opens her mouth. I'm like, ah, you know, and watching my man Daniel grow up. I, I tell you, it's just been such a blessing. Love you guys. Love you guys and all that you do. And man, I'm glad to be here this morning. And about 22 years ago, I was 18. Okay. <laughs> Whew, yeah. Feel like the world starts to move in on you, don't you, Sam? I always get to pick on Sam from time to time. You ought to feel special about that. And uh, there's a few other people I could mention. There. Gray, how you doing back here, Gray? Where you at? You back there? Hey, Gray, I told her last time I'm going to get her from the pulpit, but I'm not getting you today. I just want to say hey to you, all right? So uh, but about 22 years ago, I was 18 years old, and I was pastoring. Now, before the story goes any further, we all recognize and know I shouldn't have been pastoring, okay? <laughs> um, but I was pastoring, and uh, one night, well, one morning, about 2 o'clock in the morning, a, uh, a cousin of mine uh, comes beating on my front door, and, uh, and I didn't know it was her at the time, but I hear this knock at my door and just beating on my door. I come to the door, and there she is just crying and so excuse me, sobbing and just all broken and busted up. And her husband's in the car, and uh, they've been fighting all day and into the night, and they needed me to come to the rescue, you know. And, man, I was Johnny on the spot. I'm ready, you know. I, but I wasn't married at the time. I had no idea about what marriage was really like. And so I went out to that car, and for about 45 minutes, I gave them all the Word of God they could handle and all the opinions I had. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, so, so as I'm doing that, it just gets worse. <laughs> all right. I'm not helping them at all. And after about 45 minutes of me... I start to have a little alarm go off in me, and I think, man, this isn't, this, isn't doing, this isn't going the way it's supposed to. We're supposed to be, you know, saying I'm sorry by now, not I hate you even more, right? And so uh, I, I just like, I'm, as I'm talking, I'm saying, God, help me, please, you know, because I did care for my cousins, and I knew I was supposed to be a pastor, and I was supposed to have the right things to say, you know. Well, God speaks to me differently than he does some people, but if I ever heard God, I just heard him say, uh, just shut up and sit down. <laughs> so, so <laughs> that's what, I, oh, thank you, God, I appreciate that. So anyway, I looked at him, I said, listen, guys, I love y'all, don't go anywhere, I don't want anybody to be murdered tonight, you know. Uh, you sit right here in the car, and I'm gonna go inside, I've gotta check on some things, you know. And so I go into the house, and I'm just sitting on my couch, and coming back and forth to the window, checking to see what they were doing and praying. I didn't know what else to do. I'm like, God, I'm desperate. I need help, you know. I need you to step in, intervene, something, okay. And so after about 30 minutes of being inside the house, fretting and wandering and talking to God, um, I'm, I'm getting this message of, hey, you're trying to do it by yourself. Now I want you to go, and I'm going to do it with you, okay. And, and so I finally felt, go back out to the car. And I, I mean, I just, in humility, I head back to the car. And man, I lean over in that car and the windows roll down. And I just go to say, hey. And when I went to say that, it was like a dump truck of warm oil just backed up and dumped all over that car. And they started sobbing and crying, snotting and repenting. And I'm, I for, forgive me. And, you know, and here I'm in the middle of, I'm sorry, you know, I'm saying. And, and we're all learning something. All three of us are learning something. And, and I learned a lesson that night that I will never, ever forget. And I pray I never forget. And that is things are different when the presence of God shows up. When God is present, I mean, you can preach, but if God's not in it, the Bible said, except the Lord build the house, those that labor, labor in vain. And so if God's not in what you're doing, if he's not partnered with you, if you're not in, let me say like this, what he's doing, okay, then what you're doing is uh, of none effect. And so I learned a lesson that night that I didn't want to counsel anybody ever without the presence of God. The team, they've heard me say it a lot of times, I don't want to come out here and sing without knowing that me and God are together, right? As I'm getting ready to preach today, I don't want to preach with God saying, you know, I'm not really with you, Mark. You know, good luck. Have a fun time by yourself. I want the presence of God to be in everything I do, and I want to walk in his presence. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I've grown up in church. My dad was a pastor. I mean, as long as I've been in church in my diapers, I <laughs> says how long. And, and, and I, I'm in love with Jesus, more in love with Jesus than I've ever been. Uh, excited about where we're headed as a church. And, but I have heard some phrases over the years, and a few of them are like this. Uh, man, God really showed up today. 
You ever heard that phrase? Or, man, God, I really felt God's presence in that song. And, man, when, when such and such happened last this Sunday, boy, I tell you what, God was in the house today. God moved today. And years ago, I didn't really have a problem with those statements. I was probably saying them. But um, as I get older and get, I feel like connected closer to God, better understand Him, that statement sort of bugs me a little bit. And here's why. Because it almost implies that God wasn't here last week and that God wasn't there in the next song and that God may not or may move the next coming Sunday that we're about to be in. And, and what I absolutely believe is that God is always ready to move for us. Now, that's good news. The challenge is, and this is what I really uh, want us to get today, just starting off, is that when people say those kinds of things, what I've learned to hear is what they really are saying is, man, I move today. When somebody walks out and says, man, worship was amazing today, what I really hear was, man, I worshiped. I connected. I connected with God, and he connected with me. And because of that, something happened, and I'm alive. And there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to understand that God's not a hit-and-miss God. God's not sitting here this morning thinking, oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. God's not looking at the hungry thinking, how are we going to feed them? He's not looking at those who are broken and hurt and thinking, hey, how are we going to get those help to them? He knows his plan. He knows his desire. And what he's waiting on is for us to move. Man, that's good preaching. Okay. <laughs> God's always, thank you, Brian. God's always, always pursuing us he has been from the beginning and he's doing it to this day i love what psalms 23 6 says it says surely the goodness and the love of the lord will follow me all the days of my life now think about that that's a promise from god that surely the goodness surely the mercy surely the passion of god will follow me until my last breath now that's persistent you ever seen an ugly guy with a pretty woman? It's that same persistence. <laughs> no, it was actually more miraculous than that. Okay, anyway, uh, the, reality, the reality is, is God does never stops pursuing you. You need to know that. You need to know it and believe it in your bones that God loves you and that he's after you. Now, there's a couple of things I think we need to cover as we move forward. One of them is, I want to say it like this. You've heard this before. God is omnipresent. He's omnipresent. That just means he's everywhere. He's in this building. He's outside this building. He's in America. He's in Africa. He's all over the world. God is everywhere. And that's, but that's not the presence that I want to preach about today. It's not the presence that I want to talk about. There's a, there's a difference and a distinction in the scriptures. And what I found is, is all throughout the scripture, when God talks about his presence, it actually is a word that's uh, derived from the word pawnees. It's a, a, a word that means face. And so you could easily say the face of God or the presence of God. And so if you were to make this prayer, God, I want to see your face, uh, you're really maybe saying, I want to see your presence. Or man, if you're you're like, man, I just want to feel your presence. And you're saying, I want to see the face of God, okay? And so, so I'm not talking about a presence where we know that God is. We know that he exists, and we know he's there in the background if we need him. But we're talking about a Pawnee experience of face-to-face -face with God. Now, what I'm afraid of is that too many people, including myself from time to time, uh, we get real comfortable with, I'm good with the omnipresent God. I'm good knowing that I'm just going to do my thing and I'm going to walk the way I walk and I'm going to do what I want to do. And if I get into the ditch, then, hey, God's there. I can say, hey, God, I'm in the ditch today. Will you get me out? And can I tell you that I think a lot of people live in that experience and then I know within my heart today that God is saying, I'm not real satisfied with this omnipresent experience. I want to know you face to face. Now, I've been married for 17 years, and I love my beautiful wife, Kelly. She, uh, she normally gets to come to one of the services. She might have been in first service today. Uh, but I got to tell you, and any of you married men know, and married wives, you know too, 
uh, that if I go home and I've been gone all week and work and busy and everything else and I go home and I just get on my phone and play and get on Facebook and play games and whatever else I could say hey honey I'm here but is she gonna believe that <laughs> is she gonna feel that no because I'm not giving her that FaceTime. I'm not giving her that interaction time. And so she expects, and as she should, and I expect, and as I should, that, hey, when we're together, let's be together, right? Let's come together. I don't want to know that Mark is just omnipresent in the yard somewhere. Right? I don't want to know he's just on the property. I want to know that he's engaged me. Does that make sense to anybody? And so that's God's heart to us. It's like, look, I, I, I just don't want to be in the room. I want to talk to you face to face. I want to interact with you. I want me and you to interact with one another. And so we know that, that it means face and, and that many, most of the references in the Bible, when it talks about the presence of God going before you, it could easily, just as easy to say, the face of God going before you, all right? Now, there's a scripture I want to read to you. Um, because if we misunderstand it, it might seem as though it contradicts, but it's Exodus chapter 30, verse 20. It says this, no man can see God and live. <laughs> so, so the whole past however many minutes I've been talking, is about we want to see God, but then God, it just says simply, no man can see God and live. Um, and, and, but there's more to the story. If you go back and read the story, you find out in verse 18 that Moses is talking with God. He's having a conversation with God. I believe a face-to-face -face conversation with God. And in that conversation, he just says to God, hey, God, I want to see your glory. And that word glory right there means abundance. So he says to God, God, I want to see all of you. Right, doesn't that make sense? I've seen your face, but I've, I've had conversations. But God, I want more. I want to see all of you. And then God's response to him is, hey, no man can see my face. And then he says, and no man can see my abundance and live at any time. If any man were to see me in my fullness, you would die. You can't take who I am. You can't handle what I am. And so what I love about this is it shows God's intent because as we read further, you see where God says, but here's what I'm going to do. He's a problem solver, right? <laughs> I like this. He says, look, I can't show you or reveal my fullness to you and it not kill you, but here's what I can do. Um, I've had a little conversation, and, and what I've decided is over here beside me, there's a rock. If you'll come stand on that rock in the cleft of that rock, there's a hole for you to hide. If you'll get in that hide, what I'm going to do, when I bring all my fullness by you, I'm going to pass by you, and I'm going to hide you from it, okay? But when I get past you, I'm going to remove my hand just for a brief moment and let you catch the hinder parts of who I am. God found a way to reveal as much of himself as he could. Now, we know that Moses, just in that little glimpse, all right, his face shone with so much glory that when he came down from the mount, they had to put a veil over his face because people couldn't handle that. The reality is this morning is God wants to be close to you. Woo. Man, it's quiet. I like that. <laughs> And so God wants to be close to us, all right? He wants that face-to-face -face interaction. He wants to know that somebody is willing, all right, to see him face-to-face. -face. Somebody's not satisfied with this outskirt, omnipresent experience. But God, I want to be near you. I want to be close to you. I like Moses. He, you know, even when God told him, said, look, you know, if, if I show you all of me, you're going to die. Moses like, I'll roll them dice. I'll take that time. I'll take that chance. I just want to see more of you. And so we continue, and, and we find out in the beginning, that the creation story, that even in the very beginning of, or in, in uh, Genesis, uh, it says God creates Adam, and on the sixth day, and he places him in the Garden of Eden, this garden that he had created for mankind. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, it says then that God then commands Adam, says, listen, you can eat of every tree in the garden, but you can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? You can eat of every other tree, the tree of life, you can live forever, but leave this one tree alone, all right? And, and so um, as God commands that to him, he, he's interacting with Adam, but he notices something. He says, it's not good for Adam to be alone. He's And that time when he's not face-to-face -face with him, he's thinking, man, Adam needs some FaceTime with somebody else, 
All right, and so uh, God then goes on a journey, and it says he creates all the animals and brings all the animals before Adam, and Adam names every one of them. And then there's a little statement that says at the end of that, there was not found among the animals uh, a help meet for Adam. There was not found anything that was suitable enough. And so he then takes Adam and puts a deep sleep on him and makes him go to sleep and, and takes a rib out of his side and creates this woman. And, and when Adam wakes up, he sees her for the first time, and he's like, whoa, whoa woman you know <laughs> like uh you're you're bone of my bone flesh of my flesh yay i mean i don't know i don't know what he said but i love what verse verse 25 said it said adam and eve were both naked and felt no shame when's the last time you were naked and didn't feel ashamed <laughs> Hey, I, me, Kelly, me, Kelly, and Branson were uh, shopping. I have uh, a, a beautiful wife, and I also have three boys. A 16-year-old, I think he may be over there somewhere. What's up, son? A 14-year-old, I'm not sure if he's serving or where he's at. But, and then I have a 4-year-old. They're all boys, so pray for me, okay? Um, and we had been shopping yesterday, and we... I, <laughs> If you don't know you're tired, you need to go hang out with a four-year-old, all right? And you need to take him to public places and just see how that works. It, it's, it can be trying. Uh, and, and, and so we were out, and me and Kelly were just chasing him through the coat rags and, you know, how that moment where they disappear, and you're like, you were just here, and where are you at now? I mean, you know, it just gets stressful after a while. And, and I told Kelly, I said, look, I'm going to let you pay. I'm going to take him outside. We're going to the truck. And she's like, good deal, you know? And so I take him out. We get out to the truck, and... I get him buckled up, and I'm just like, you know, you know that moment when you sit down, you're like, <sighs> you know, think we're in a cage. We can't, you know, I mean, he's, he's strapped down, and I'm in a car. We can't go anywhere. Hallelujah, right? Um, so I'm, I'm just like relaxed, and just about the time I just get relaxed, you're like, I got to pee. <laughs> and with a four-year-old, it's never more than 30 seconds time. I mean, it's not like you can travel far to get to a bathroom are you going to have a mess to clean up? And so, um, so I'm like, what? Where? I, you know, we're at we're at on the outside of the parking lot at Belks at the mall in Albany. I'm thinking I'm going to have to go in the bathroom, find a bathroom. I don't even know where a bathroom is in Belks. And then we're going to go to the mall. We'll never make it. So, like a good old Southern boy, I said, "Where's the nearest bush?" <laughs> Where's the nearest bush? Yeah, I'm that guy. Okay, all right. You know, what's funny is I was thinking to myself, I hope I don't get caught here. I'm confessing here. So, um, <laughs> so, so there is a nice set of bushes over here beside the door belts, but it's like there's a bunch of bushes, and then there's like a cave opening, and you could go in there, and nobody really see you, you know? And so I'm like, hey, Branson, come over here. And Branson, come over here. Come on, Branson, let's pee in it. Don't you want to pee in here? Uh-uh. I said, no, Branson, right this hole. And so the only place he was comfortable was uh, on this side of the bushes where his butt could face the opening door, you know? <laughs> and so finally, finally, I'm like, whatever. I'm just going to pretend like this isn't happening, you know? Uh, some, I don't know whose kid that is. If somebody would pull up, it's like, can you believe it? You know. Uh, <laughs> so um, without any shame, the man, the little man just takes, you know, uses the bathroom right there, the bushes at Belks and Albany. Sorry about that. Okay. But no shame. I said all that to say that. No shame. When's the last time you woke up with no shame? It's a concept we are so familiar with our guilt and we're so familiar with what we've done and we're so familiar with our sins and our mess ups and our mistakes that what we can't even fathom truly understand what it means to wake up tomorrow with none of that on us. We really don't even know who we are without it. But Adam and Eve, here they were, both naked and felt no shame. And so we keep reading in Genesis 3 verse 7, it says... Um, that, you know, God had commanded them not to eat, but then the woman, she's in the garden talking with the serpent, is like, hey, um, you know, it's all the fruit was good and that it was pleasing to me, and, um, and then it was desirable for gaining wisdom, makes me smarter. And so she took and ate some of it, you know. They, they, she just decided that was a good thing to do. And, and then she come back and brought some to her husband who was with her, and, and he ate it. And, and then it says in verse 7, it says, the eyes of them were both open, and they realized they were naked. They had no idea 
that their innocence was about to be completely removed. They had no, they couldn't fathom what it would be like to take and partake of this fruit and then to wake up feeling shame. And so you know what they did? They immediately began to hide from themselves. They hid themselves. They, 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 it says they sewed fig leaves together to protect themselves from their nakedness, right? Now, this is a note I want to make. Before God came in, before God came looking for them, they was already in the process of hiding from themselves. And I got to tell you, I just believe that's where most of us or a lot of people are at. The mountain of your mistakes, the mountain of your shames. Maybe you've not been the husband or the daddy or the wife or the mama or the business owner. Or maybe you're ate up. You're not the son or daughter. You feel guilty and it's like I've, I've made so many mistakes. You will spend your life hiding from your own mistakes. We hide behind religion. We hide behind our spouses, relationships, and friends. People hide behind addictions. They hide behind lies that they made and somebody else said. They hide behind prestige. People hide behind money. They hide behind power. But the point is people hide. And God's saying, hey, you don't have to hide. You don't have to hide this morning. So we're good. I'm good with the omnipresence of God. As long as I don't have to kind of come clean and really talk about my mistakes because I don't want to bring them up. So then we keep reading and we see where in verse 8 it says, The man and his wife heard the sound of God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from God among the trees. But God called to the man and said, Adam, where are you? Now look, they went from hiding their shame and hiding from each other to now they're hiding from who? God. The Bible says your sins will separate you from God. Do you know why? God doesn't hide. He doesn't forsake you. He doesn't turn on you, but you will hide from him. You ever had a relationship and you're like, please don't shut the door on me. Please don't turn away. Please, please don't turn a deaf ear to me. Why? Because you love them and you're like, please. My beautiful Caleb can be so sweet, but sometimes I'm like, please don't walk away, son. I'm not going to pick on you, buddy. I'm not. He's good looking, ain't he? <laughs> Looks like your daddy. But when something comes between us and God, we have a tendency, this is our natural tendency, to turn and hide. And it robs us from the grace and the mercy that God wants to give. So Adam and Eve, here they are hiding from God. Now, this, listen, God comes down to Adam and says, Adam, what did you do, son? Adam said, well, we hid because we're naked. You know, well, who told you you were naked? You didn't know that yesterday. Did you eat the tree, the fruit of, of tree of knowledge of good and evil? And Adam said, yes, we ate of it, but it, the wife you created for me, the woman you created, she's, she did it. <laughs> you know what Adam is? He's shameful and he's blameful. Listen, don't be shameful and blameful with God. Don't find yourself in a position where you're blaming God for your life. You're blaming God for your mistakes. You're blaming God for your relationship. You're blaming God for your children. You're blaming God for your financial status. You're blaming God for your addictions. It's not God's fault. So Adam was blameful. And so God says, okay, Eve, what is this thing that you've done? And you know what she says? She's like the serpent you created beguiled me. It was his fault. And so then God comes down and he talks to the serpent and says, you know, <laughs> this is a little point. It's funny to me. He didn't ask the serpent, uh, what's this thing that you've done? Uh, because he had no one to blame. <laughs> it's tough when you're the bottom of the pole. You know what I mean? And so God's like, look, 
because you've done this thing, this is your punishment. It comes back to Eve. Because you've done this thing, then your desire is going to be to your husband, and you're going to be saved through childbearing. Then he comes to Adam and says, Adam, because you've done this, I'm going to have to kick you out of the Garden of Eden. You're going to earn from the sweat of your brow from the ground. It'll never give its fruit to you again. You have to go out of this garden. You cannot eat of the tree of life, live forever, and be in a blameful and shameful state of mind. Now, that's tough, isn't it? And so he puts a cherubim and a flaming sword at the the tree of life to protect it from mankind, from Adam coming back into it. I want to keep going. In Genesis chapter 4, it says this, that the Lord said to Cain, now anybody know who Cain is? Cain is the brother of Abel. And Cain and Abel are the sons of Adam and Eve, okay? What I like about this, just right off the bat, the Lord said to Cain, You know what that means? It means that when God kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden and forbade them to ever come back and eat the tree of life, he did not kick them out of his presence. Do you hear that? He didn't say, you know, because you're evil, wicked, no good for nothing, good evil doers, you can never be in my presence again. He said, look, you cannot be blameful and shameful and eat of the tree of life, but hey, I want you to know, wherever you go, I'm going to go. Do you know that God loves you? He loves you this morning. He's not looking to drag your past up into your face. He's not looking to make you feel lower than you may already feel. He wants to lift you up. He wants to wrap his arms around you. He wants you to know you're the apple of his eye. And so Cain Why are you angry? Cain had just made a sacrifice with his brother Abel, and the thing was, Cain's sacrifice was not what God asked for. And rather than Cain just saying, you know what, I didn't bring what you asked me to bring, I'm sorry, let me go get that, I'll be back in five. Instead of saying that, he says, you know what, I I, I can't handle this, I don't like this, I mean, whatever, he gets angry about it. And God says to him, listen to me, you got to pick up your spirit, you got to change your attitude, because he's basically saying to him, if you don't change your heart and do what's right, sin lays at the door, and it's trying to own you, but you must rule over it. you got to grab a hold of it, Cain. God's wrestling with Cain, just like he's maybe wrestling with you right now overcome the thing that's in your life stand up to it step over it conquer it you must rule over it and so God's talking to Cain and as he's talking to him Cain makes the decision I assume goes out and grabs his brother hey let's go out and look for some birds you want to goes out there and while he's there Cain attacks Abel murders him and now we have the same scene that was in the garden again here comes God hey where's Abel Cain said, I don't know. And then he replied, am I my brother's keeper? I cannot help but read it somewhat with a sarcastic attitude. I, I don't, I was like, and it blows my mind. If God were to come down and speak to you audibly, how would you respond? Huh? <laughs> I know we'd all want to say, I would fall down on my knees and honor the great and mighty God. You would probably fall down on the floor and Be scared out of your mind. You'd wonder, am am I losing it? Am I losing it? Am I losing it? What was that? I don't know what that was. What's going on? If God were to come down and speak to you like that, but Cain has had such a face-to-face, a pony experience with God that it's normal. And so nonchalantly, he just says, am I my brother's keeper? And God responds and says, listen, the blood of your brother cries out of the ground, and because of it, you have done something, and you're going to be cursed, and the, the ground would no longer yield its crops for you, and you'll be a restless wanderer on this earth. And then he says in verse 13, which I think is so powerful to understand, and Cain says to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today, you are driving me from the land. That's part A, right? But part B is the thing I cannot handle, and that is I will be hidden from your presence. I will be hidden from your face. It's more than I can bear. Don't drive me from your presence, God. In Psalms 105, it says to seek his face or presence, right, continually. In Psalms 34, it says the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. In uh, 1 John chapter 4, it says we love him because he first 
loved us. We know how to love because his love that he gave to us. God's passion and love for us is unrelenting, unending this morning. He loves you. In Romans chapter 5, verse 8, it says this, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In John 3, 16, most of us have heard or know by heart, and that is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved. 1 John chapter 1, it says this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he was in the beginning with God and all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. And in him was life and the life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the children of God. All right, and those who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, but nor of the will of man, but the will of God. And verse 14, I absolutely love this part. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Can you see what's happening? There's a, there's a train coming down the tracks and it's God and he's saying, look, I wanna be closer. <laughs> I'm not close enough, I wanna be closer. I'm not, I'm not good with this omnipresent relationship. I want a Pawnee face-to-face relationship. But more than that, I want to dwell in you. I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. And so it says then, we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came to dwell with us, Emmanuel, God with us. Why did he come? Because the sins that have separated mankind from God. He came to fulfill a law, to wash us clean, to make us whole. That through him, through him, we could have relationship with the Father. John 16, Jesus then says, he's talking to his disciples and said, this should make you happy, but instead it's made you sorrowful. In chapter 16, verse 6, it said, your hearts are filled with sorrow because I have told you these things. He said, but I tell you the truth, it is for your benefit that I am going away. He said, unless I go away, the advocate, the comforter, the helper, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. See, it's God's presence that lives on the outside that inspires and moves us. But it's God's presence on the inside that conquers the enemy in our life. It's God's presence that helps you to say you're strong when you're weak. It's God's presence that helps you to stand up instead of sitting down. He helps you to bless people instead of cursing people. God's presence helps you to love people instead of giving hate. He helps you to forgive instead of holding grudges. He helps you to turn your cheek instead of punching the cheek. Any punchers in here? Okay, you don't have to admit it. It's all right. (laughs) It's his presence that helps you to overcome addiction. It's his presence that helps you overcome depression and hopelessness and bitterness and fear and brokenness and past pains and hurts. It's his spirit that lives within you that helps you to overcome all the things the enemy would love to trap you with this morning. We need his presence. We need his presence. We need it. We need it in our lives, in our hearts. We need it in our homes. There's relationships in this room right now. You are broken and busted and hurting, and you don't know how to forgive. You've been, there's people in here, you've been wounded to a degree, and you've been asking, I don't, you, you'd even say it with your mouth, I don't know how to overcome this right here. And let me tell you, as long as you try to do it on your own, you won't. 
It is only God himself. It is his spirit that lives within you that comes that can help you overcome any obstacle. Help you to forgive any hurt, any pain. One of the things I love is this God comes to live with us and make us powerful and overcome the enemy in our lives. There's another step to this because once we're full of the Spirit of God and the presence of God, we are now commissioned to go and give it away. <laughs> Did you know that? That was the main commission. That was the commission, the great commission. It says that he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You know, I want to tell you, um, I've had people tell me, I'm not sure how to share the gospel. Well, go home and share it with your cat until you get good. <laughs> I know it's biblical preach the gospel to every creature okay go home and preach to your cows preach to your dog preach to the birds preach to the trees preach until you got preach all in you <laughs> I don't know how to share the gospel practice on an ant I mean practice on somebody every creature that was good wasn't it we can go home now but preach the gospel to every creature, and he who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he that does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, and they will speak with new tongues. And they will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. And they will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. God desperately needs you this morning to be full of his presence in such a way that when you walk out of these doors, and you go sit down at that restaurant, and that little waitress comes over to talk to you, you look her eyeball to eyeball, and you say, you know what? There's hope for you tomorrow. There's peace for you. There's hope right now. Listen, there are people who are broken and hurting today, and they need a hand to come up and grab them on the back and say, Honey, it's going to be all right. Young men, young women, teenagers. With the Spirit of God, you can overcome any temptation. I'm pointing this way because there's a lot of them over there. It's the Spirit of God. The enemy would love for you to believe that mom and daddy don't know what it's like. But it's the Spirit of God that will help you overcome any obstacle in your way. I bet if you thought just for a second right now in this church, all of you, anybody in this room, you thought for a second you could come across real quick, somebody hurting and needing. And God's saying, listen, I want you to be my hands and my feet. I want you to go give them hope. Give them some joy. Give them some encouragement. Let them know it's going to be all right. I love in Exodus uh, 33, Moses made a commitment to God he's like God said listen go over into the promised land go on over and go and then Moses kind of got the feeling that God wasn't going to go with him <laughs> and so he's like hey God are you going by the way I got a question are you going and and he's like you know I'm just ad living here but basically you, you can go read it later but it's 33 verse 14 and 15 Exodus 33 14 and 15 and Moses is like listen I, I just made up my mind if you're not going I'm good to stay right here I know it's a wilderness and all that. I know it's tough and we're not eating that great and the water scares and it's hot and, you know, all that other stuff. But, man, if your presence is in the wilderness, that's where I want to be. My question to you is how desperate are you to have the presence of God in your life? Now, last week, and I, I told God, I made a commitment to him, and I've said this, God, you do the work and I'll brag on you. I'll, can I brag on God just for a minute? Because <laughs> last Saturday... Uh, Friday, we, decided, we, we just got the news that old Hurricane Irma was coming up here to say hello. <laughs> and uh, and they, were, they were pretty confident that she was going to come right through Cockwood County and, uh, and knock on some doors, right? And so, man, as that news really got out and started to settle in on people, I, I, I can remember the mood, of the, kind of the, the town sort of changed a little bit. And, and this is what I mean. Uh, you go to Publix and... Uh, you didn't really, you just, there were a lot of people buying a lot of things, and, you know, water was gone, uh, <laughs> vegetables, fruits, they, I mean, that was gone. Uh, you couldn't find a banana. I don't care what, um, people like bananas in Cockwood County is all I'm saying, but, <laughs> like, man, for three days, I couldn't find a banana. I needed that for my oatmeal, but anyway, um, <laughs> I'm like, wow, God. No, um, but, but I mean, the water's gone, and you walk down the sandwich aisle, and all the meat's gone. I mean, you know, 
and snacks, people left all the, either the nasty snacks or the expensive ones. I mean, you know, like if you're willing to pay $10 for four bars, that was there. Uh, you could buy $5 water if you wanted to, but, but average common man food was gone. <laughs> and, and one night I was in Publix and I was just like, you know, I was kind of, I was, I, I, it wasn't funny to me, but I was like, whoa, you know, and so as I'm, I'm sitting there looking, I'm walking through Publix and I wasn't, I wasn't there for water because I still had water at home and I figured worst case, I'd just fill up some garbage bags or something, you know, but we'd get through it. And, and so, but I walked through and this guy, I mean, he's, he's, a, he's a grown man. I mean, probably 35, 40, just standing looking at the water shelves, you know, where water was and his lips were just quivering and he's like, I mean... I really thought he's about to fall out any time just in a full-grown cry fit. I mean, he did not know what to do, and I realized people are panicking. People are scared out of their mind. They've never... I I grew up on the coast. I grew up in Panama City. So, you know, hurricanes were kind of a part of the atmosphere. It happens, you know, and so it didn't affect me that much, but... But I, I realized that the atmosphere started changing. People started kind of panicking and fear started gripping in. And at that same time, um, I started to get to witness the Spirit of God starting to uh, move. You know? <laughs> the presence of God was like, hey, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna stand up here and do something. And so while Walmart was out of water and out of everything and Publix was out and all that, then we were on the background of what was happening here Saturday, and we started having conversations. We'd have been asked by the city to become a storm shelter. We didn't know what role we could play before then, but uh, with, this is the blow, mind-blowing thing. With no water, no food, no cots, no plan at the time, no plan, okay? Uh, all we had was a facility. We were like, you know what? If, if we're being asked, then we're going to say yes! And then it's like, what do we do now? <laughs> It, it, it kind of was like that, and you know, and so um, we have a great missions pastor, Emily Hall. She she early on got started with just talking to the storehouse team and kind of get the word out, and then uh, she went to talk with our very own Brian Lasser. What up, Brian? How you doing, brother? Uh, just uh, an, um, just a, a great asset to our church. So thankful for them to be back. And, and, and as they're talking, Emily sort of just uh, said, hey, Brian, this might be more in your uh, camp uh, to, to lead, and, and would you? And so Brian's like, he, he stood up to the challenge. He's like, yes, still, we didn't really have an army of troops. We didn't have anything lined up. And so then we start to mention, uh, you know, we come in, Brad calls me and says, hey, don't think we can just have church as normal uh, given there's a hurricane threatening to blow us away you know and it's like I think you're right on that <laughs> you know so um so we decided hey we're just gonna cancel our main thing and uh, and just come in here and we're gonna worship and pray and just kind of intercede for the community and people in the side and and maybe get the word out man I thought we had a sweet service last Sunday but then you know Brad said hey let's just ask anybody who wants to be a part to come across and join us in the atrium or you know in team life central and 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 so I thought I really I mean this is the doubting Thomas said, man, I'm like, 20 people is going to be here because everybody's going home to cover their own places, you know. And, and I realize there's so many needs. And, man, I walk across the room, open the door. There's over 100 people in that room. You know what? I start to see the presence of God rising up. Saying, you know, in a, in a time where fear is coming, in a time where questions are coming, in a time where people don't know, I'm going to posture up and I'm going to say there's going to be hope. Right? And so, and so, man, quickly, I mean, quickly, That thing turned into something bigger, and we had 125 volunteers down here on a Sunday evening preparing, getting ready. Cots and beds started to show up. Food started to show up, and water, and all the necessities it would take, and manpower. And before it was over, we ministered to 270, I want to say 71, is that right? Uh, Over 270 evacuees. And I got to tell you, if you're standing at the door and you're watching these men and women come in, not feeling secure where they were, right? Looking for someone to love on them. Someone to say, hey, there's hope. Someone to say, there's safety. Someone to say, we've got your back. Somebody who will stand up and say, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is not sitting back wondering what's going to happen during Hurricane Irma. He's got a plan, but he needed somebody to step up and say yes. (laughs) And you said yes. You said yes. So thankful. So thankful for church that will say yes. Now my next question, and I'm closing here. I'm getting ready to close. Are you tired of living a mundane life? 
Are you tired of living without purpose? Are you tired of waking up in the morning and with a little gnawing side of you saying, I'm not really sure why I'm here. Because I can tell you, you can chase money and money won't fill the spot. Hollywood has proven to us fame will not fill the spot. Addictions, people, I mean, just go down the list. You make your own list. None of that will fill the ache that you may have inside this morning to belong to something. I, I got to tell you, I have the answer for that little gnaw inside of you. That sounds arrogant, but I'm going to say it with confidence. I know the answer. You were created to fellowship with a living God. You were created to have a face-to-face -face relationship with your Creator. My question to you today is, will you say yes? I want to I pray two prayers for us. First one is, I do not, we'd ever want to leave a service without giving an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. So I'm going to invite you right now, man. every eye to close, every head to bow. I just want the whole place to pray this prayer with me. Maybe you're here and you just don't know where you're at. Will you let the Spirit of God come live in you? Will you make the decision to say, yes, I want that Pondy experience. I want that face-to-face. -face. Pray this prayer. Jesus, I hear you calling. I hear you calling my name. And I say, yes. I surrender my life. Everything I am, all of my possessions, all of my worth, all of my heart, all of my effort, my energy, I lay it at your feet. Come into my life, oh God. Conquer the things in me that are wrong. Drive out the enemy from my life. I receive you and I say yes to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 Come on, church. Amen, everybody. Thank you, Mark.